Huge shout out to Dominic Eagle for tonight's story. Make sure to go check out his YouTube channel called Black Volumes. He also does horror stories and creepypastas. Link will be in the description below. In 2023, we found a World War II fortress in a German mountain. People lived inside for 80 years. Well, they used to be people. My name is Danica Craven, and I've been an archaeologist for the past decade. Tantalizing opportunities often fall into my lap. Some drenched relic washes up on an Egyptian beach, or a lonesome fossil is uncovered. But I'm often beaten to the punch. That's the nature of the game. And as the years go by, fewer ancient gems remain undiscovered. Consequently, last December, I was dumbfounded by elite in the Bavarian Alps. Being the first one to the scene is a gift that shouldn't be squandered. My team and I investigated a frosty nook near Schuckspitze, Germany's mightiest mountain. Two days earlier, in the wake of a fearsome blizzard, a misshapen steel panel was found in the snow, halfway up a steep cliffside. Amir Langton and I had suspicions regarding its origin. Suspicions confirmed when our team unearthed something near to the site at which the panel was found. Concrete. I told you. I gloated. I know you did. Amir laughed. But temper your expectations, Danny. We don't know what we have found. There may not be an entrance. Oh, it's there. I assured him. And an hour later, there came the satisfying clunk of metal against metal. Enzo Flores, our chief digger, had uncovered a lofty metallic door. Depleted by a day's work, he finally let his shovel fall into the snow. We followed suit, dropping our tools. Though I'd been digging significantly slower than the burly laborers, I still felt a sense of achievement. A smile broadened across my cheeks. Crikey, that's been hidden under the snow for decades, Amir whispered. Unbelievable. You love that word, don't you? I smiled. Even when we get inside and see undeniable proof, you'll still call me delusional. Well, that's the thing, he said, scratching his neck. How will we get in there? Not with this measly equipment, Enzo said. We'll need something heavy-duty to breach the door. The man, a hulking figure with rosy frosted cheeks, led us out of the snow tunnel that we'd spent hours digging. Explosives? Anselm Becker asked. Calm down, kid. A hydraulic system should do the trick, Enzo said. But we aren't opening it tonight. Snow's coming down. The daylight has gone. Everyone's cold and tired. I huffed. But we, not tonight, Miss Craven, Enzo insisted. Amir? I said, turning to my friend for assistance. My colleague shrugged. Sorry, Danica. We won't be able to do anything without Enzo and his men. But this is an undiscovered German stronghold, I said. In 24 hours, we won't be the only people here. You know that local will already have told everyone about the panel he found. We're going to pack up and head to the town, Enzo said firmly. I'll see you in the morning. An idea came to me. Amir, let's camp here, I said. Guard the tunnel, stake a claim. This is our site and I don't want anyone to take it. I would strongly advise against that, Miss Craven, Enzo cautioned, rubbing a gloved hand against his red brow. Other than tourists in the Igloo Resort, nobody sleeps on the mountain. Wild camping isn't safe. Leave a tent for us, and we'll be fine, I promised. Amir, are you happy to stay with me? My partner nodded. Sure, Danny. Enzo growled, barging past us and beginning to pack his equipment. We do appreciate your help, Enzo, I said. You don't need to appreciate it, he huffed. I don't get paid to be appreciated, and I sure shit don't get paid to babysit. With that, Enzo Flores and his men began walking down the mountain a slope below us, heading towards the warm embrace of lights in the town. I'm sorry, Amir, I said, as we tucked ourselves into our sleeping bags. He shrugged, smiling. I respect you, Danica. You're more dedicated to this line of work than anyone I know. You deserve this find. So, let's guard it. I'm being paranoid, I sighed. 
No doubt about that, Amir chuckled. But it doesn't hurt to be safe, does it? We'd kick ourselves if someone were to invade our freshly dug site. We've done the hard work. I smirked. I mean, it was mostly done by Enzo. It was mostly done by Enzo. Amir agreed. And we laughed. Thanks, I said. You're always so level-headed. It's a talent of mine, he grinned. As I dozed off, I had never felt safer in my life. Wrapped in a snug cotton cocoon, I was soothed by shrieking gusts and the rippling tent fabric. Our tent blocked the entrance to the snow tunnel, the gateway to a hidden World War II shelter. It was the jewel of my career. My life. That cozy feeling of accomplishment it didn't last, however. Amir and I were woken by a husky bellow in the early hours of the morning. What was that? My friend panted, sitting upright. I don't know. I breathlessly replied, rubbing my eyes. It sounded. I was interrupted by the sound of snow crunching beneath immense weight. Something too heavy and slow to be human. There must be an animal out there. Amir whispered. What animals would be caught in this blizzard? I asked. And it wasn't a person. Neither of us contested that. The crunches were too loud. Though our bodily instincts should have kept us inside, our intrigued minds got the better of us. Mother always said curiosity would be the death of me. Amir cleared his throat. <clears throat> Do you? Yes, I answered before he finished his question. My colleague tentatively opened the zip to the tent, and we peeked at the darkened mountain, shrouded by an incessant downpour of white flecks. Near the rim of our campsite, illuminated by the tall spotlight Enzo had left behind, deep tracks led through the snow. Something had skirted around the edge of the site, and for a hunting second, beyond the spotlight, I saw a black shape flit out of view. A towering figure concealed by torrential snowfall. Did you see that? I cried in horror. No? Amir replied, frowning. What was it? I don't know, I said. It didn't look like an animal. Well, no person made those tracks, he said, nodding at the enormous footprints. It had to be a... I don't know. What time is it? I checked my watch. Nearly four in the morning. Enzo and the others should be here in a few hours. My friend nodded. Let's go back to sleep. We'll stay quiet. If the animal were planning to attack us, it already would have done so. Amir? I've been thinking about something. I said. What? He asked. I paused, nodding at the archaeological find beside my sleeping bag. This steel panel is crumpled and battered. They had a nasty storm up here, Amir said. Bad weather is common in the Bavarian Alps. This German fortress is buried beneath the snow. It's built into the mountain. I don't think a storm dislodged the panel, Amir. I said. Did somebody remove it, perhaps? We might not be the first people to find the shelter. You need to stop worrying about that, my colleague said. Nobody's beaten us. We should find out, I said, already slipping into my gear. I certainly won't be able to sleep now. Amir groaned before nodding and getting dressed. Torches at the ready, we stepped into the frozen world of Shuk Spitze, utterly alone in the darkness. No hope of sunlight to guide us for another three or four hours. And I knew Amir was right. We should have waited. But I'd been doing that for years, and it had cost me so many opportunities. I wasn't going to make that same mistake again, as reckless as that may sound. Living was more important than surviving. You pointed out that the panel looked like it may have housed ventilation slats. I said, the crumpled metal did have that fake shape. Sure, Amir shrugged. So, if it has broken free, that may be another access point to the fortress. I pointed out. But this bunker might be humongous. The ventilation system could be anywhere. You're not seriously planning on doing more digging at this hour, are you? He asked. As I said, the panel has already broken free. Either Mother Nature or another person has already done the digging for us. I said, Come on, let's look around. 
Bear in mind is that 48 hours of fresh snowfall will likely have covered whatever was uncovered, Amir noted. I know, I said. 30 yards to the side of the tent, there stood a flag. It marked the spot at which the panel had been found, our starting point for the excavation. The small pole and its flapping fabric were both wearing thick, snowy blankets. What are you hoping to find? Amir asked. Think about it, I said. A ventilation system missing its slats, that might provide another access point to the bunker. Wait, Amir said, pointing at a protruding rock face 30 yards up the slope. See that? I squinted through the snowfall and saw what Amir had spotted. Streaks of red dyed the snow across the limestone face. I shuddered. Is that... Blood, Amir coldly finished. I was wrong about that animal. It isn't harmless. We should head to the town. I shook my head. I won't stop now. My friend groaned. Don't be stupid, Danica. You're not going to follow that trail. But I'd already started wading through the snow, lighting the way with my torch once I passed beyond the reach of the spotlight. For crying out loud, Danica, you know I'm going to have to follow you. Amir grunted, trudging after me. You don't have to come with me. I said, I just need to see this place before anyone else, Amir. This is our discovery. But my colleague ran after me, and we battled against the willful breeze. The bloody trail continued for a hundred yards, painting a terrible wavy line across the snow-covered wall. It stopped at a hole in the rock face, a cavernous hole of twisted metal. I was right, I gasped. This structure is bigger than we ever imagined. I don't know how I feel about this, Amir said. We should wait for Enzo and the others. It'll be daytime when they arrive. I'm not going to make you follow me, I said. I feel guilty enough for asking you to camp on this freezing mountain. Look, if, if somebody has removed that ventilation panel, then, Amir sighed. We've already been beaten to this discovery, Danica. It's over. I'm sorry. I shook my head, shivering. The metal is bending towards us, Amir. Whatever removed the panel, it did so from inside the vent. I shone my torch's light into the blackened pit, revealing a rusted ventilation shaft, a metal tunnel that veered quickly to the left. The entrance to the tunnel was partially filled with fresh snowfall. I stepped inside, surprised by the width and height of the vent. I crouched slightly, but it was a broad passageway. Danny, please, Amir begged, grabbing my arm. Don't do this. The blood is... Something's in there, I interrupted, gently removing his hand. Go back to the tent, Amir. Call Enzo. But I'm not going back until I've seen the fortress with my own eyes. This is going to be the biggest discovery in archaeological history. Amir did not turn around, however. He begrudgingly followed me into the ventilation shaft. Our boots squelched in the snow and then came the squelch of whatever maroon-colored gunk lay at our feet. Most likely blood, but it was mixed with something. I don't like this, Amir whispered, his voice echoing around the ceaseless metal chamber. The stench is unbearable. At least it masks your body odor, I quipped. I'm not in the mood, Danny, Amir said. This all feels... Oh my, I gasped. Stopping in my tracks, I looked down at the gaping hole in the floor of the vent, the hole which would have claimed me if I had taken another step. When Amir and I pointed our torches at it, we saw a small bedroom, the quarters of long-gone soldiers. Inside, there were two bunk beds, barely held together by rotting wood and covered with maggot-ridden mattresses. The horror of my discovery finally filled my bones, paralyzing my spine. And Amir saw that in my stiff, unmoving body. You've seen the bunker. We were first. We should head back now, he pleaded. This isn't right. No human made that hole, I said. No animal. Even less of a reason to go down there, Amir insisted. I'm begging you, Danny. We need to leave. Now, before we find that thing you saw. I'll go down. I'm just going to take a look at this first room. Then we'll head back to the camp. You stay up here, I said before sitting down and dangling my legs into the hole. 
I'm not helping you, he said. Well, it's going to hurt when I hit the floor, I shrugged. My colleague sighed, seeing that I wasn't bluffing, and he placed his torch onto the floor, lighting the tunnel. Then, he held my arms tightly. As I gingerly slid over the edge of the hole, I felt like a child daring to tip a toe out of her duvet, in spite of the monsters beneath the bed. I placed one foot on the top bunk and lowered my second leg delicately. In a swift movement, I broke free from Amir's grip. I screamed as the mattress and supporting wooden planks collapsed under my weight. Danny? Amir cried. My friend collected his torch and swiftly jumped into the hole, landing with a resounding thunk. As I easily sat upright, lost in a festering mound of rotten wood and filthy cotton, I noticed Amir hobbling towards me. Are you okay? He grimaced, helping me to my feet. I'm fine, I groaned. Are you? I think I might have twisted my ankle, my friend said. I winced. I'm sorry, Amir. This was... You were right. This was way too dangerous. Come on, let's get you back to camp. He shook his head. I'm strong enough to lift you back up, but you're not going to be able to lift me. No offense. But you need help. What if you've broken something? I asked. There's not a lot that could be done now. Amir sighed. This is why I said we should wait until the morning. I know. I said, hugging the man tightly. I'm sorry. Have I mentioned that? Yes, but not enough times. He smiled. Still, you are right. This, this place is real. And it's unbelievable. Your favorite word. Are you going to keep saying that? I chuckled. Take the win, he said. Okay, I replied, smiling weakly. I told you so. Are you going to keep saying that? He asked, grinning. For a moment, we forgot about the sounds we'd heard on the mountain. The blood in the snow. The black shape I'd seen in the distance. None of those things mattered. Amir and I were explorers again. Blind to danger. Jubilant about our astounding discovery. Anyway, the best option would be to lift you into the tent. Amir said. You should fetch Enzo, then come back here. Look at this, I said, ignoring my friend. A journal. On a small cabinet at the end of the demolished bunk bed, there sat a dusty, leather-bound book. I blew off the cobwebs and flicked away a persistent spider. The diary was written in German, of course, but I'm fluent. The diary of Conrad Vogel. I translated it. That's great, Danny, Amir said. Now, come over here so I can lift you up. Okay, I sighed, pocketing the journal. I'll rush back to camp and phone Enzo. We'll get you out of here. He's going to be pissed, Amir warned, preparing his hands to lift me. I shrugged, climbing onto Amir's sturdy palms. He's always pissed. This time, he'll be royally pissed, he grunted, raising me through the hole. Everything will be fine, worry ward. I said, climbing into the ventilation shaft. I'll hurry back. Don't go anywhere. Funny, Amir said. Don't mind me. I'll just have a nap on this crusty mattress. I hurried through the vent and emerged into the blizzard, which felt merciless after being sheltered by a castle of steel and concrete. I fought against the elements, wading back to the campsite. Once inside the tent, I immediately used the satellite phone to contact Enzo. My mobile wasn't receiving any signal. It's half four in the morning, the man muttered from the receiver. Why have you woken me, Miss Craven? I took a deep breath, preparing for a lecture. Amir and I found something. What do you mean? The man growled. We heard footsteps, and then we found a trail of blood. I started. Enzo paused. There shouldn't be any wild animals on the mountain. Certainly not in this weather. It wasn't a wild animal, Mr. Flores, I said. The blood led to a ventilation shaft. It's another way of accessing the fortress. You, Enzo barked, before composing himself. You explored an uncharted, century-old building without supervision at night. Is that what you mean to tell me? Well, I... we had a little... accident. I gulped. I felt Enzo's rage through the phone. 
What happened, Miss Graven? Amir injured his ankle. I whispered timidly. What? Enzo roared. Where is he now? In the bunker, I said. I came back to the campsite to ask you for help. We have to get him out of there. Stay where you are, the man growled. Do not go anywhere without us. The phone fell silent, and I had nothing to do but sit and wait. It would take an hour for Enzo to reach me, at the very least, and I didn't want to cause any more problems. But then, I excitedly remembered what lay in my coat. I scooped the diary of Conrad Vogel out of my pocket. January 2nd, 1948 It has been nearly three years since we won the war. Commander Meyer, however, insists that the surface remains unsafe. The Fuhrer has claimed the world, but roaches remain, of course, a resistance that seeks to squash us. Bavaria is at war. That is why we must stay hidden until German forces have come to save us. Hidden in the Tollerberg, our Fuhrer's mightiest stronghold. I still have doubts, but I will never voice them aloud. Even writing such things will put my life at risk. But I must pen my thoughts. I am losing my mind. I cannot bottle up these feelings any longer. Corporal Fisher died today. I had the privilege of clearing his room, and I found this empty journal in his belongings. Strange that he would never use it. It's a sign. God longs for me to do something more than fester in this shithole. So, let me get this off my chest. There are two possible truths. The war continues. Or, we have lost. But, we have not won. Why would we still be hiding down here? February 27th, 1948 It's harder to keep up with a diary than I thought. Even with nothing to do down here, the mind wanders. Wanders to strange places. One of the crop rooms failed last week. I don't know why. Tollerberg is full of advanced technology. Things beyond my understanding. But we've got dozens of crop rooms. We'll be okay. I don't really care as long as I get fed. But I feel the nearing tide of descent. People are angry and afraid. And it is not good to be with scared men in a cage. Sure, we have an abundance of food. But how long are we going to stay down here? What happens when more crop rooms fail? At some point, we won't have enough to feed everybody. I vote that we stop feeding the prisoners. I don't share the ideals of our Fuhrer, though it is treason to say so. Nonetheless, I hate the British and the French. Let them starve. Commander Meyer told us the crop rooms wouldn't fail. He told us this fortress would stand for a thousand years. So many lies. March 12th, 1948 Another crop room failed. That's two in two months. Nobody's going hungry yet, but the murmuring is getting louder. I don't like the thought of an underground mutiny. Not much else to report. Charlotte and I have been meeting in my room when my bunkmates are away. She is a terrible nurse, but an excellent lover. August 15th, 1948 Some privates left Tollerberg yesterday. Cowards. I do not know why we are cowering down here. I do not believe in the Fuhrer's cause, but I know that I love my country. I will never leave the Tollerberg. I will never betray Germany. December 25th, 1948 This is the first Christmas I have celebrated in ten years. Commander Meyer senses the fewer sentiment of the people. To quell our dangerous thoughts, he has allowed us to honor our Christian traditions. The fewer would not approve, but he isn't here, is he? I think he might be dead. June 21st, 1951 I forgot about this old thing. Life intervened. Death intervened. So many crop rooms have failed over the past three years. And, as I predicted, rations have commenced. So much for Tollerberg lasting a thousand years. Many have rioted, faced execution, and become martyrs for future revolutions. 
perpetuating an endless cycle of death. Riot. Die. Riot. Die. We despise the prisoners. More mouths to feed. Enemy mouths. But Commander Meyer tells us that a prisoner equals power. Why do we need hostages? To me, that is not the statement of a winning side. But I've known that for years. The war is over. December 1st, 1951. The men are falling sick. The women too, though they have been prioritized. It is the starving who suffer the greatest. Fortunately, we have begun to prioritize Germans when it comes to food. Most of the prisoners are ill. They're starving and living in dire conditions. But Commander Meyer finally values self-preservation over power. However, he's starting to lose his grip. March 12th, 1952. Dr. Klein says that many of the sick are infected with tuberculosis. They have caught the White Death, an old disease. There was talk of a cure for it towards the end of the war. Though such a thing may exist, it doesn't exist down here, and the sick are only getting sicker. We are trapped in a tin can. March 30th, 1952. The sick have been confined to the West Quarter, the Armory. There is one section for German patients and a separate section for prisoners. We will quarantine them there until they die. They have been left with adequate provisions. All I keep thinking is that there will be fewer mouths to feed. And I am glad. July 10th, 1954. Much has changed in two years. I found this book whilst clearing my bunkmate's belongings. I stashed it on his mattress. He would never think to look there. Not that it matters now. His name was Bertram, and he caught the white death. No matter how many times we quarantine the sick, the disease always returns. Dr. Klein has been conducting tests, trying to find a cure. He grows tired of begging Commander Meyer to let us leave the Tullerberg. Like me, he surely knows that there is no war. He knows that we have lost. But he would not dare to leave this place of his own accord. I don't think anybody really leaves. November 2nd, 1955 I have a reason to unearth this journal once more. Charlotte has given birth to our child, one of only 20 children born in the 14 years we have spent in this bunker. I have named them Fritz Vogel. I fear for the boy's life. I pray that Commander Meyer succumbs to old age in the near future. He seems to be the last threat holding this place together. After him, we may even leave this place. Few people believe in the cause of the Fuhrer. November 16th, 1956 Each year passes in the blink of an eye. One might expect time to drag in such a place. No, time does not exist here. Fritz is the only thing keeping Charlotte and me going. But we are lucky. We have more than most. And for that, I'm grateful. We are grateful. Our population dwindles. Ten years ago, there were a thousand of us in this underground city. 600 people remain. The White Death ebbs and flows. Whenever we think it has disappeared, it claims another dozen lives or so. But Dr. Klein promises that he is close to a solution. He conducts tests only on the prisoners. That is what he says anyway. I only fear that his tests continue to put all of us at risk. We shouldn't be keeping the sick alive. Put bullets in their heads. Eliminate the risk. Doctors think too much. Life is not that complicated. Klein will kill us all. May 7th, 1961 It seems I uncovered this journal at milestones in my life. And this will be my final one. The White Death has finally caught me. I have requested that I be killed tonight. Killed and cremated. I don't want to be another one of Klein's experiments. I don't trust that he only experiments on the prisoners. The aging man has claimed for the past seven years to be on the verge of a breakthrough. All I see is a pile of bodies. I only hope 
I have not passed this terrible affliction to Charlotte or Fritz. I am not a good man, but they are pure people. Charlotte is a woman of conviction. She doesn't want to be here. She cares only for healing people, as terrible as she may be at doing so. And Fritz is a gentle soul. He doesn't deserve this life. I pray this place does not eat him alive in my absence. Shuddering at the German soldier's last entry, I turned the page to find a fresh entry. The Diary of Fritz Vogel October 27th, 1973 My name is Fritz, and I don't know whether anyone will ever read my father's diary. They will likely never read my locks either. I found my father's book whilst packing my things and moving to a new room in the south wing. Mother is sad to see me go, and I'm scared too. But I'm 18 now, and I knew this day would come. Commander Meyer insists that all men become soldiers, all women become nurses or teachers. It seems meaningless, so few of us remain. And I have found it baffling to read my father's account of this place. Stranger still to imagine a world outside of Tollerberg. Father talked of 1,000 people living in this place. Well, more than 30 years later, there are 500 of us, and the White Death still lingers. But it's not the threat it used to be. Of course, we lose people every year. There aren't many people left to have children. September 8th, 1974 I only remember this book when I feel that my feelings might finally bubble over. My father was right. Writing is the only thing that distinguishes the insanity. I've been working with Cuckoo Klein in the laboratory. That is what my friends call him, but he doesn't seem that bad to me. Perhaps I focused too much on my father's journal entries. He talked of a determined, intelligent doctor. That being said, the old man I see is, admittedly, a little lost. I've been told he still experiments on the prisoners in the abandoned West Wing, but they all died long ago. As Commander Meyer said, the war is over. There's no need to waste precious resources on the enemy. He's a very different man from the one father described. Of course, he's getting old too. February 16th, 1975 I was excited to work in the lab. It was better than other soldierly duties. Patrols, guarding the old armory in the West Wing, cleaning toilets. But I'm starting to agree with my friends. Dr. Klein makes me uncomfortable. You are sick, he tells me. But I keep you healthy. Lena tells me that he often says the same to her. She keeps me from losing my head. December 2nd, 1976 Mother passed. She caught the white death. Dr. Klein told me that the old ones don't have what it takes, not like the young blood, the post-war babies. I don't think he should have said that to me. Commander Meyer still tells the obvious lie that the war rages onwards. I've asked Commander Meyer to assign me to a different department. It took all of my willpower not to thump the doctor in the face for his callous comments following my mother's death. November 19th, 1989 Thirteen years have passed, a lifetime in many ways, but life is just as grueling as I remember. Still, it seemed fitting to return to this diary at a momentous juncture of my life. Much has changed in Tollerberg. I am Colonel Fritz Vogel. I work as Commander Braun's right-hand man. Not that we have many people left to lead. One hundred men, women and children live in Tollerberg. Father often talked of revolutions and escapees, but we do not fear that. All survivors are either too old to leave or too young to know any other life. Bron and I have discussed it before, making the call to leave this place. But what lies beyond the fortress? A world that does not belong to the Fuhrer. The Fuhrer is dead. That was what Commander Meyer revealed to us on his deathbed. A secret we must keep. I have not even told my wife, Lena. We lost the war in 1945, ten years before I was even born. And this stronghold is the home of the Fuhrer's last men and women. The commander was a selfish man. When he learned that Germany had lost the war, 
he told nobody in Tullerberg. He continued to lie, told folk to remain strong and patient. After all, this castle was built to last. Indoor crop fields, water drawn from the snow on the mountain, and a thousand other advanced machines that made this the perfect haven. A home for millennium. The commander told us that we were finally free to leave. He wouldn't stop us. But where would we go? This is the only home the children have ever known. If we were to step foot into the outside world, it would reject us. And that is not the only secret Commander Meyer revealed. The prisoners and their descendants are still alive in the armory. For 35 years, Dr. Klein has been conducting experiments on them. The rumors were true, he's still trying to cure the White Death. And though he has not succeeded, he has developed a treatment. A treatment that he has been giving to children for decades. That's why we haven't been getting sick. He gives every newborn baby a temporary vaccine, and then he slips treatments into our food. It only works on the young. Something about the vaccine only working on young flesh. It kills the old. Dr. Klein must be the luckiest man on earth to have worked so closely with infected patients for nearly four decades without becoming sick himself. The man has to be in his 80s. August 31st, 1992. Lena and I have just welcomed our baby girl to the world, Ella, the third generation of the Vogel family to live in this godforsaken place. Still, there is nothing short of a miracle in these times. There are 72 survivors. Most of the old guard has perished. However, against all odds, Dr. Klein persists. He must be the oldest man in the bunker by a country mile. I imagine he has a picture of Dorian Gray stashed somewhere in his room. April 5th, 1995 You must see my work. The doctor said that to me today. He has been trying to show me the armory in the West Wing for years. I have refused. Commander Braun saw something in there. Something that made him sick in the head. He took his life. We have no commander now. I don't want to face the same fate. Klein has told me more than I wanted to hear. It's horrible enough to know that those poor prisoners of war are still alive. Prisoners of a war that ended 50 years ago. Lena and I don't believe in any of this. We don't believe in the things that the Fuhrer said. The idea of a perfect race. What does that even mean? I don't want to know what things he said. But based on stories from the old folk, we were on the wrong side of history. They wouldn't say that, of course. There are fewer people to keep things running. Fewer people who know how to fix machinery and grow crops. After Commander Braun died, I disbanded the patrols. There is no army. It's a group of scared people hiding on the ground. Too afraid of the world lying beyond the door. Worst of all, the White Death has returned. December 1st, 1996 I finally succumbed to the doctor's demands. I joined them in the old armory. Over the past year, old age and the white death have both killed every member of the old guard, other than Dr. Klein. There are roughly 50 people living in this hole. Most survivors are under the age of 40. None of us know of the world before the bunker. None of us know of the world beyond the bunker. Before we die, I had to know what the doctor was doing. And it was far worse than anything I could have possibly imagined. The surviving prisoners are the children and grandchildren of the English and French prisoners. They have known no life beyond the West Wing, beyond their cages. But that wasn't what horrified me the most. The German ward of the armory is empty. No sick have survived in there. But in the prison ward, Klein introduced me to cages of children. They were bloated beyond breaking point, gargantuan, bulging people. Not just their bellies, but their limbs and faces. Their skin was green and swollen, as if their entire bodies had developed gangrene. The doctor ignored my disturbed reaction. He began to taunt the children, spitting in their cage, calling them vile, sickening names, telling them that God had punished them for their sins. The very sin of being born in the cases of the Jewish prisoners. My father was a man of God, 
and that didn't sound right to me. The children said nothing in response, just surveyed us with agonized, glassy eyes, eyes that seemed to beg me for death. Before I even knew what I was doing, I drew my father's ancient revolver and unloaded all six rounds into the doctor's back. He did not die immediately, not like a normal man. But then, Dr. Klein was not really a man anymore. Who knows what experiments he conducted to prolong his life. And as I stood over the doctor, who smiled with blood pooling in his lips, he told me a terrible secret. He found a cure for the white death before I was even born. A cure that he administered to the young folk before we were born. But the side effects could be seen in the cages. The green and blackened children. Dr. Klein told me that he found a way to stop the disease from killing us by binding our minds with the bacteria, fusing us into a singular entity. The host keeps the disease alive, and the disease keeps the host alive. But there is no kind of life. What happened to those children is not human. He'd been putting treatments in the food of the German children not to fight the disease, but to stop the cure from turning us into monsters like the prisoners. And, as Dr. Klein died at my feet, I realized something terrible. Without him, there will be no more treatment. As my heart raced, I turned the page to find nothing but manic scribbles. Scribbles that continued over the course of numerous pages. The occasional word or phrase was easily discernible. Heat. Warmth. Eat heat. Not that it made sense. My heart raced as I thought about the dark shape I'd seen outside the tent. The looming shadow with ginormous footsteps. One or more of the taller Burke residents had survived. A mirror, I whispered fearfully. Enzo Flores arrived with Anselm Becker close to six in the morning. The snowfall showed no sign of easing, and neither did the temper of the lead workman. I heard him long before I saw him. He began to roar over the wind and I unzipped the tent to see the two men walking under the spotlight. Where is he? Enzo shouted at me. I'll show you, I meekly responded, stepping out of the tent. We hurried in silence up the slope, following the bloody trail along the rock face. It had mostly been covered by fresh snow. I moved quickly, afraid of Enzo catching up to me and giving me a proper scolding. But I eventually stopped in front of the torn entrance to the ventilation shaft. I hadn't told Mr. Flores of the horrifying revelations I found in the diary. There's nobody other than Amir down there. I fearfully and unconvincingly told my rapid heartbeat. What were you thinking? The lead laborer screamed over the gusty weather. I asked them not to follow me. I croakily replied. How would that be better? Enzo asked. You would have been the one stuck down there, and he wouldn't even know. It's done now, Anselm softly said attempting to defuse the tension. Not until we found them, Enzo huffed, charging into the entrance. I followed our disgruntled leader into the meadow tunnel, and his timid worker joined me. After a minute or two of scurrying along the winding passageway, we arrived at the hole above the bedroom. He's in there, I sighed as Enzo shone his torch's light into the hole. We're back, Amir! There was no response. Enzo jumped through the opening in the vent, and landed on the bedroom floor with feline nimbleness. Anselm and I widened our eyes in shock. He's not down here, Enzo growled. Is this the wrong room, Miss Craven? What? I asked, peering into the hole. No, that's... there's the bed that broke when... this is the room, Mr. Flores. My heartbeat quickened. Words from the journal sounded in my brain, overlapping in a charring cacophony. I thought of the underground society in ruins, thoughts of Fritz Vogel. I wondered what had happened to him and the others after the final legible entry in 1996. That was nearly 30 years ago, I reminded myself. They're all dead now. Well, he's gone, Enzo angrily pointed out. Did he fancy a stroll, eh? I, I don't know, I whispered. The doors open, our leader said. Was it open when you were in here? I don't remember, I said. Maybe. No, no it wasn't. Right, so he's in this place somewhere. 
Do you have any idea of the dangers that might lurk down here? Enzo barked. I stammered. I'll p- pay you more for pay me more. The man prayed hysterically. Are you joking? There is no amount of money that covers this. This bunker is nearly a century old. It's falling apart at the seams. Exploring it will kill us. Is that what my life is worth to you, Miss Craven? A few extra pounds? You need to breathe, Enzo. Anselm said. We're coming down, and Well, of course you're coming down. The Spaniard spat. How do you expect me to live with the mere death on my conscience? We have to find them. Enzo lifted his broad arms and motioned with his hands. Jump, he bluntly ordered. I think you and I should do this alone, Anselm stated. No, she's coming, Enzo hissed. I didn't argue. I slid my legs over the edge and fell into Enzo's grip. He roughly handled my waist, as if meaning to hurt me. And then, he delicately helped Anselm back her down. Moving my flashlight around, nothing in the deserted bedroom looked different, other than the open door. There were no signs left by Amir, none that I noticed anyway. Lead the way, Miss Craven, Enzo said, nodding at the door. I gulped, terrified by the fact that the torch's light seemed to do nothing to permeate the thick sea of blackness beyond the open doorway. And when I left the safe confines of the bedroom, I found myself standing in a forgotten hallway lined with an endless sea of doors. I looked back at the bedroom door, room 421. I committed that to my memory. How do we find them? I asked. I have no idea, Miss Craven, Enzo sighed. I'm a laborer, not a search and rescue specialist. I was expecting to find a man with a twisted ankle in that room, a simple in and out job. Perhaps we should head down the mountain, Anselm said. Find some proper help. Before Enzo and I acknowledged Anselm's wise comment, a distant sound of pain filled the corridor, either groaning metal or a groaning voice. Miss Craven, you said you saw something. Enzo whispered. What exactly did you see? I gulped, shaking my head in terror. No, I... No, no, it wasn't. I don't... A reverberating scream tunneled down the hallway, pinging off the walls. It sent a ripple of shivers down my spine. It was a mirror. We're not turning around now, Enzo said, lifting the torch. It came from this direction. You're not serious, Anselm said. I didn't sign up for this. You told me we were lifting a guy out of a hole, but this is insane. What did I just hear? A mirror, I whispered. No, Anselm said, shaking his head. Before that, you know what I mean. I did, but I didn't want to think about what had made that awful moaning noise. I want to know what destroyed the ventilation shaft, Enzo said. Nothing's coming to mind, Miss Craven, and your face is growing paler by the second. I'll ask one more time. What did you see? I wasn't afraid of what I saw, I whispered, pulling the diary out of my pocket. I was afraid of what I read. Enzo eyed me frightfully, as if reading the secrets of the journal in my petrified gaze. I don't want to know, do I? He whispered knowingly. I want to find Mr. Langton and leave this place. Anselm uttered a sound of protest, but Enzo had already begun to walk down the hallway, leading us towards the source of the groaning. Holy, Enzo gasped, stopping suddenly. I didn't have to ask. My eyes were drawn to the spot on the floor that he was illuminating. A threadbare soldier's uniform was lying in a mound of dust, the final resting place of some poor decayed soul. And as we continued along the corridor, we saw others. Through open doorways, we saw uniforms on beds. The victims of the white death. Or something worse. I thought of Fritz's final entry, the revelation that Dr. Klein had cured the new generation of Tollerberg, but it had cost their humanity. Without treatment, a person's mind joined with the disease, plagued all thoughts. From the final pages of Fritz's journal, that much was clear. Cantina, Enzo read. I assume that means canteen? I nodded, and our leader led us down the corridor that the sign was pointing towards. I felt unsettled about leaving the main hallway. I only hoped we would be able to find our way back to the room of Fritz Vogel, room 421. Lord above, save us, Enzo cried, illuminating the deserted canteen. 
It was filled with long tables, and several uniforms of the Kate soldiers lay on the benches. Citizens, I should say. In the end, there were no soldiers, only the malformed children of Nazis and prisoners. There are fresh footprints in the dust, Enzo said, pointing at the floor. He's not here, but he's close. Anselm noted the exit at the far side of the canteen. That way. We headed out of the canteen, and I quaked as we passed dozens of empty uniforms. Only, I knew that the clothes weren't empty. The ashy remains of dead bunker dwellers sat within the mounds of clothes left behind. But my greatest fear lay beyond the dining area. The canteen exited onto another hallway, and Enzo pointed at a long faded board on the wall. Waffenkammer, he said. The arrows point left. What does that word mean, Miss Craven? I choked tearfully. Armory. Well, the dust trail leads that way. So... No, I interrupted, shaking my head. We have to leave this place. What? Enzo frowned. This is your fault, Miss Craven. We're not leaving Mr. Langton behind. I know, I said, shaking. But that's why I don't want anyone else to- What? Flores pressed. Spit it out, Craven. I know you're keeping something from me. Another unearthly wail sounded from the end of the corridor. There were no doors along the hallway, only one at the end. The entrance to the west wing. The armory, a prison for the souls cursed with the white death. Enzo and Anselm began walking down the corridor and my knocking knees slowed my pace as I unwillingly followed them. The two men had no idea what lay in wait. They only wanted the whole ordeal to end. It would, soon enough. When we reached the door labeled Waffenkammer, we realized it wasn't much of a door at all. It had been torn in half, with planks of festering wood lying on the floor. A pit of darkness lay beyond the half-demolished door, and it swung open with a tender push. We entered a narrow walkway, lined with metal cages. Each barred section housed abandoned boxes of ammunition, and ancient rifles were attached to the walls. There were worn mattresses and more crumpled uniforms on the floors of the cages. This had been the first ward of the quarantine zone, the German ward. There came another sound, quieter this time, the pitiful cry of a pained dog, breathy crying, labored crying. Something's in here, Anselm wailed, his voice bouncing off the walls of the confined corridor. His utterance deadened the cry, and the hallway plunged into silence. A shadow danced along the wall, a shape just beyond the glow of Enzo's light. There was a moment of stillness, no movement or sound, the falls calmless at the eye of the storm. And then, a moan sounded from the ceiling, followed by a thump. Something had landed between us and the door. We turned to face whatever had trapped us in the armory. Darkness charged forwards. A colossal being darted towards us. A humanoid of such enormity that it could not fit comfortably between the cages of ammunition. Its flesh puckered and creased as it squished its horrible, portly form through the narrow corridor. It was an abomination that should never have walked the surface of Earth. Fritz's final entry did not do the hellish thing justice. Its infected skin oozed darkened sludge and pus, and its eyes were bulbous, gray, unseeing spheres. But it sensed us. The creature swiped at my screeching face, tearing into my flesh, and I praised for what I hoped would be a swift death. However, Enzo Flores stepped between the beast and me and was in the creature's grasp before I even blinked. The dreadful demon, distended beyond natural limits, was somehow holding itself together with rotting deceased, stretch-marked flesh. Run! Enzo yelled, grappling with the thing that used to be human. Anselm and I continued to run down the hallway, seeing no other way out other than pressing forwards. We heard the sounds of squelching and screaming, shredding flesh, crunching bones. Anselm led the way with his torch, and we saw a door fifty yards ahead, just as the ominous sounds ceased, and the frightening laborer shoulder barged the door with all of his might. It burst open, and we scurried inside. A mighty shriek was unleashed behind us, 
the battle cry of something neither living nor dead. Shut it! Anselm screamed. I hurriedly slammed the door and fiddled with the rusty lock until it clicked. And then I turned around to find myself facing the ward that matched the description Fritz Vogel had given. A second line of cages, much like those in the first section of the armory. Except the German ward had makeshift rooms. The shabby quarters in the second hallway clearly belonged to the prisoners. What exactly was written in that book? Anselm suddenly asked. I shook my head. Enzo was right. You don't want to know. Anselm nodded, and we walked along another hallway of ammunition cages that had been transformed into homes for the sick. Bland gray clothes, bearing the prisoners' numbers, lay in piles within the cages. The bodies of soldiers and their children kept imprisoned decades after the end of the war. A terrifying thought in itself. A thought only interrupted by a terrible wheezing noise. Do you hear that? Anselm asked weakly. It sounds like... Breathing, I moaned in horror. I expected to see another ghoul lurking in the shadows at the end of the corridor. But I realized the sound was coming from my side. And then I cast my torch's light into one of the cages. A room with warped metal bars. Within the room, two uniformed prisoners were drenched in blood and dirt. The numbers were concealed by years of filth, and their clothes were ripping at the seams thanks to their bulging forms. But most dreadfully, they were glued together, their flesh at joint like two rotten mounds of clay mushed into one awful entity. The two mouths of the entity opened in unison, revealing black, toothless chasms. Warm, they said together. Eat. Warm. Warmth. Horrified, I recalled the deranged scribbles of Fritz Vogel. He had said similar things. No! Anselm yelped, lighting a patch of floor beside the conjoined prisoners. I recognized the crumpled heap. Two crumpled heaps. A mirror. His body had been torn at the waist, and his intestines tied the two separated halves together. I wailed, mind disintegrating as I eyeballed my friend's undignified corpse. I didn't want to imagine the horror and pain he had endured in his final moments of life. And as I noted the chunks of flesh missing from his body, along with the fresh blood on the lips of the conjoined prisoners, I understood the full twisted truth. Eat warmth. A booming thud erupted my thoughts. The door! Anselm whispered. That thing is about to break through it. I was lost in the daze, but the laborer grabbed my shoulders and twisted me to face him. Danica, he said. I'll get you out of here when it passes your cage. Run! I didn't respond. Tears painted my petrified face, but the men shoved my detached body into the open cage on the opposite side of the hallway. He switched my torch off and placed the finger to his lips. The creature barreled into the ward of the prisoners. I was barely cognizant of Anselm running down the hallway, moving towards the end of the room. But I realized what he was doing. Hey! He screamed at the creature, waving his torch. It was over in seconds. The bulbous being, almost supernatural in essence, fired down the walkway, unaware of me. And it lunged towards the screaming laborer at the far end of the armory. I slipped out of the cage, subconsciously fleeing the scene. Some primitive urge controlled my physical form, but I continuously twisted my head, foolishly locking eyes with the horrible sight at the end of the room. The creature tore Anselm to pieces in seconds. The worker didn't have time to utter a sound or make a move. But that isn't why my mouth gaped in horror. The creature's bare back, colored black and green from disease, bore six swollen, circular wounds. It's not him, I told myself, stifling a scream. I ran, ran faster than my legs should have been able to carry me, and I expected the one person to catch me before I made it to the canteen, let alone the bedroom. But it didn't pursue me, and when I finally faced back into reality, I was standing in room 421, gazing up at the hole in the vent. 
but I barely remember how I got there. I knew I waded through the muck of Enzo's half-devoured corpse, but that memory is a disjointed nightmare. There are blank spots in my mind, a protection mechanism perhaps. After heaving the remaining bunk bed under the hole and crossing my fingers, I hauled my body onto it. It did not collapse under my weight, and I managed to pull myself into the ventilation shaft. Sobbing, reduced to a broken being, I stumbled through the winding tunnel and entered a world dimly lit by the dawning sun. A red hue streaked the sky, and the blizzard had quieted. Flecks of snow fell gently, and the breeze blew quietly. The mountain felt unnaturally still, unaware of the horror that lay below its surface. I ran down the slope, eventually falling into the main road of the town below. I was a sobbing, unintelligible heap. Shivering on a snowy street, I was found by a local hotel receptionist, disturbed by the sound of wailing in a town that was ordinarily so peaceful. I told everyone everything. I didn't care how crazy I sounded. They would see for themselves when they entered Tollerberg. To an extent, they did. After breaching the bunker door and exploring the facility, they found so much of what I described. The uniforms of fallen soldiers, the destroyed vent, the blood, even the remnants of my team. But no sign of the monsters. They had fled. The psychiatrist still tells me that they never existed. After all, what remained of my team members had been found in a pile of rubble at the far end of the armory. A collapsed ceiling killed them. That remains the official verdict. But I know better. I know what I saw. I have the diary of the Vogels. Most tellingly, I have the scar on my face. A scar that still hasn't healed. It worsens by the day. My blue pupils have been fading to grey. And... There is a voice in my head that I don't recognize. One that hungers for something I don't understand. Warmth. <laughs>